Hi, I'm Terry Bills, the Transportation Industry Manager here at Esri, and today I'm joined by Eric Rodenberg, a Solution Architect on our uh, transportation team. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to another in a series of webinars designed for departments of transportation. Uh, today we're addressing imagery and imagery management. And while imagery can come from any number of different sources, whether satellite, aerial, UAVs, or LIDAR, ground-based LIDAR, the goal for today is to introduce how you can develop an enterprise strategy for managing your agency's imagery data and discover ways in which you can help drive performance improvements in your organization. I'd like to point out that we're recording this webinar and while everyone will be on mute, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. Additionally, the demos and the slides from, uh, that are part of today's webinar will be available to you on the GeoNet group, uh, Departments of Transportation, and we will give you the link uh, to that site uh, at the end of the webinar. Okay, let's start with uh, the simple observation that just about any department in a DOT can use imagery data, and that imagery imp information has become an integral part of a large number of our standard workflows, whether we're doing initial project planning, project design work, conducting inspections, or doing maintenance in the field, having a digital view of background information can help provide context and greater validation of your business and GIS information. And while we may all agree on that, unfortunately, many agencies struggle with how to manage their imagery information in a comprehensive way, with the result that it's often the case that different departments not only manage their own imagery data, but often they have separate procurements for their own data independently from others. Another common problem is that given the scale and the size of various imagery data, many agencies struggle with managing the very large volumes of data, with the result that few outside of a small group are able to access imagery data that may already be held within their own organizations. So we'd like to suggest that there are a set of common themes that most DOTs need to address best with respect to imagery data. And chief among those is how to achieve a comprehensive and efficient way of delivering imagery information to the users without creating lots of duplication and redundancy. So how can I create an enterprise strategy which can make the agency's imagery available to a wide range of users given my current IT architecture and infrastructure constraints? And this raises a second major issue, which really revolves around the size of some of these data sets. So if I'm talking about LIDAR data for an entire state highway system, I'm really probably talking about terabytes of data. How do I manage that? How do I make it easily accessible to the people who need to access that information? And that's where many agencies are increasingly looking to the cloud. And not only as a way of storing the information, but also as a way of making the data easily accessible from a map interface within my own organization. So a number of the LIDAR data collection firms that we work with are moving in the direction of providing managed services for these very large data sets and providing access through a service, access through ArcGIS Online or through a portal implementation. And a third set of questions relates to the fact that often I may have several iterations or time periods of imagery data. How do I manage this information and how do I make it easy for my users to be able to compare information over time? Let's say I want to look at changes over time or understand what was in a certain location in an earlier time period. So how can I facilitate that? Finally, the use of LIDAR data within DOTs has really exploded over the last five to ten years, whether airborne, mobile, terrestrial, DOTs have discovered a wide range of uses for LIDAR data. And in a future webinar, we'll discuss an enterprise strategy for LIDAR data collection and the wide range of uses for that data. 
But for today, we simply want to point out that increasingly DOTs are looking at how they can extract key features from LIDAR and find related data for asset inventories and how LIDAR can be used for precise measurement equivalent to traditional survey techniques. But rather than me talking about this, let me shift over to Eric Rodenberg, who's actually going to walk us through demo to illustrate a number of these concepts. Eric? Thanks, Terry. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to talk to you about imagery as uh, part of the ArcGIS platform. And we consider imagery and LiDAR data to be a, a crucial component of the, uh, of the ArcGIS platform. It's, uh, it, we feel that the ArcGIS platform can be the system of record for managing and processing all of your imagery. It is, a, it is the place where I can go to get all of my image holdings. It's the place where I can go to get all of my LiDAR holdings. And I can display that data. I can analyze that data. I can serve that data out and share it to others through either information products or through um, individual product or individual projects that engineers might be working on, safety analysts might be working on, whatever whatever the workflows may require. So we feel that the system of record that the ArcGIS platform provides is an easy way for you to manage all of your imagery. As I mentioned, we also think that the that the ArcGIS platform is a system of engagement. It's a place where I can go to get my imagery for whatever information product or whatever need I have. So we've enabled the ArcGIS platform to share imagery products out so that we can get those out to a wide number of users on a wide number of platforms or applications or, or, um, or systems. We also feel that the imagery uh, the imagery platform is a system of insight. I can extract information and ask questions of my imagery through the ArcGIS platform. I can do analysis, comprehensive analysis. I can I can save that analysis and those workflows out so that others can repeat the work that I do or tweak the work that I do to get answers to questions that they might have. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about this idea of ArcGIS as a system of record for imagery in LiDAR data. Uh, the, the ArcGIS platform is highly scalable. I can scale the system out to uh, handle small amounts of imagery or massive volumes of imagery that are terabytes, that are terabytes large. Um, we can create a catalog of imagery and we can reference all the source data. So when I typically work with, with an image service, I'm working with raw imagery, I'm working with TIFFs, I'm working with the native format that it came to me in. I ingest and define that metadata, and I can define processes that are applied on that data on the fly. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, so this idea, um, we, we take all this raw imagery and we create dynamic mosaics of that image source. So if I've got TIFF imagery for an entire state, I can create one seamless mosaic on the fly that's dynamically generated. And I can access that imagery as single images or as the entire catalog. So I have the ability to go in and find individuals just as easily as I can bring in the whole seamless mosaic. We do this through the mosaic data set. The mosaic data set is what drives imagery. Um, I, I specify where the folder or holdings of imagery are. And when I add those rasters into my mosaic data set, it recursively searches through a folder and adds those images on the fly, creating that, that dynamic uh, mosaic. And then, of course, once that mosaic data set's created, I can visualize that imagery on my desktop through ArcGIS Pro, and then eventually we'll talk about serving it out to a wider audience over the web. I can do the same thing with LiDAR data. I can take last files and associate that with the last data set. The last data set can then be ingested into a mosaic data set where I have a seamless, uh, view of my last files as a hill shade or slope or aspect or any number of information products and you'll see that in a little bit as well. We support many uh, wide-ranging sensors so I can work with imagery from, air, from uh, airplanes collected through an aerial uh, photo collection. I can collect imagery 
through uh, from satellite uh, providers, from satellite imagery providers. I can collect imagery from a drone. Using drone to map, I can take that imagery that I collect or that LiDAR data I collect, process it, and visualize it in, in a matter of hours. So if I had a specific stretch of highway um, that's under construction and I wanted to periodically review, review the changes that have happened over time, I can go out, fly that area, and within a couple hours have a service up and running that I can compare and contrast over time as the project develops. We can work with multispectral imagery where you're talking 12 bands or more. Uh, we can work with thermal imagery, radar, panchromatic, uh, as I mentioned, LiDAR data and full motion video. So lots of different sources um, and lots of different formats, as I mentioned, TIFF, JPEG, Mr. SID, and then you get into some of the satellite formats as well. So there are lots of formats that we can work with. Uh, in terms of this idea of on-the-fly processing, what that means is I can define specific processes that I want to run against my imagery and extract those out on the fly using tools like a web map or ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Desktop. So for instance, I can set up a, a, a series of, um, of functions that allow me to stretch the image, turn it into a, a, a color infrared if it's a four band image and doing it all on the fly. So I can serve the images up uh, from one source and get multiple views of it. And we'll take a look at that right now. So I'm going to pop open a web map that I've got with some imagery loaded in. <clears throat> and um, I'll go ahead and in the properties, we'll, I'll click on the image display. And I have my renderer, which allows me to choose from a number of products I've already pre-prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and change this, this image of Dayton, Ohio from color to color infrared. So we'll hit apply. And the on-the-fly processing changes that image in a matter of seconds to color infrared from color. And if I wanted to view it in another, another way, say uh, imp maybe I want to look at impervious surfaces, and I'll do a visualization called NDVI so I can see all the purple represents um, the impervious surfaces, parking lots, roads, rooftops, buildings. So you see that data really... Um, really shows up well. And then the bright green you see would be biodiversity. That's the, the parts of um, the grass that's starting to come back from the spring. This is imagery from 2012. So you're seeing a view of, of all the vegetation and you're seeing all the impervious surfaces and you're seeing things like rivers. And we're just visualizing it in different, in different mediums. So uh, we've got different, we've got all kinds of different ways that we can process this imagery on the fly and actually use it. So we'll go back to the color version, and of course I can pan around, and you see I get great response from this imagery over the web. I'm actually so serving this out from an Amazon instance that I have in the cloud. So I'm getting great response from this imagery. It renders fast, and it's easy to work with on the web or on my desktop. So when it comes time to serve our imagery up, um, there are a couple of steps that we have to go through. The first step is I have to create my mosaic data set. And to do that, I've um, in, this, in this presentation, which is going to be publicly available uh, towards the end of the, of the webinar, uh, you can go and you can click on these links and it will take you to the help links that define each of the steps. So you'll typically create a uh, file geodatabase to start. And then you'll create an empty mosaic data set. You'll define the, uh, the type of imagery you're going to store, the product type. So if I'm dealing with three band imagery, I'm going to choose the RGB natural color product type. Then you'll define the number of bands. Usually with uh, color photography, we're talking three bands. And if it's color infrared, there will be four. If we have, uh, we'll define the pixel type, and you can usually get that from the raw TIFF image details. So if I click on, the, if I go to the folder where all the TIFF images are stored and I click on one and get the properties, it'll usually be something like 8-bit eight, uh, eight, um, eight unsigned or whatever it tells you. That's what you'll pick. And you generally want to define what those properties are before you actually load the images into your Mosaic data set. So then once I do that, I'll, I'll want to have all my images organized by year. So if I have imagery from 2012, 
uh, imagery from 2014 and imagery from 2016. I want to organize each set of imagery by the year it belongs to. At the end, I can take all of those, aggregate them together as a service that will allow me to time enable them, and I can visualize over time things like change detection. So, so typically, I'll organize each of the folders by the year it was captured. And if you happen to have different size images, the Mosaic data set is really great because it can handle different sizes. So if we've got 400 scale versus uh, 2400 scale imagery, I can handle all those different odd types that you might run into, which we don't typically see much anymore, but um, it does come up from time to time. So then you'll uh, add your rasters to the Mosaic data set you created. You'll build the overviews, which is a concept that's similar to pyramids. Calculate statistics, and um, some imagery today comes pre-bundled with pyramids already built, and they're embedded in the image file. If that's the case, uh, if I check the box to build raster pyramids, if the ArcGIS system detects that those pyramids already exist, it won't build any new ones. So then once we've done all that background work, then I'm ready to publish the service. And it's literally as easy as right-clicking on the Mosaic data set and publishing as an image service to your server. So again, all these steps are defined and documented, and I've pointed to all the documentation so it's easy to find. So, um, so you can publish all kinds of rich access. You can make this available. Register it with ArcGIS Online so you get maximum accessibility. Uh, you can use ArcGIS Online as your content management for all of your image resources. It really is a great way to make it accessible to a wide ranging audience. And then from there, once I've got the imagery set up, I can start building applications and information products out of that imagery, load it into web maps so it's available for my clients like Collector or ArcGIS Explorer, or, um, or maybe I want to visualize it in Pro or, or a web application that I build in Web App Builder. Once it's registered with the portal or ArcGIS Online, then the possibilities are infinite in terms of how you can serve it out to your users. One of the things that, we, that really separates the imagery platform that Esri offers is this idea of being able to serve it out from the on-premises or in the cloud. So if I have if I own ArcGIS server licensing, I can take that licensing to the cloud and actually serve up my imagery. Um, in 2016, or 2015 rather, we released the web-optimized uh, imagery format called MRF. The MRF format enables us to host imagery through services like Amazon Web Services or Azure Storage. This is a low-cost storage environment that allows me to push all my imagery, all my raw imagery into the cloud and serve it up over the web down to my clients. Um, if you're not familiar with this, if you go to, if you open up a web map in ArcGIS Online and search for the NAPE imagery, you'll find that that imagery is all completely hosted on Amazon Web Services. And um, it's fast and it's pretty amazing what capabilities you have over any client from Amazon. And if you're interested yourself in hosting that type of imagery, actually a good, a good state to contact would be Michigan because they actually moved their imagery last, um, last June in, or last July. They signed the contract and went into uh, production in the fall, and they serve up all of their imagery over Amazon Web Services as well using Amazon S3. And like I said, it's pretty inexpensive. Amazon charges roughly $30 a month per terabyte for um, the ability to serve out files over Amazon S3. It's pretty amazing. Um, the format that I mentioned, MRF, um, we have a blog article here which I referenced that talks about the process and what, what the MRF format is. It's a format we developed in um, combination with NASA. and um, we also implemented a new compression type called LERC, which is really going to um, be used with multispectral imagery. So when you start getting into the satellite imagery that's got 8 to 12 bands, this is really where the LERC compression is going to be used. But in addition to LERC, MRF also supports uh, JPEG compression. 
So if I've got um, four band or three band imagery, which is probably most common at the DOTs, I would use the MRF with JPEG compression. And this tool, this optimized rasters tool, which I'm going to click in reference here real quick, um, this tool is uh, you download it from GitHub, and it's an ArcGIS toolbox that you install on um, ArcMap or Arc Catalog or Pro. Uh, it's supported up to ArcGIS 10.5 or later, or uh, 10.4 or later rather, and um, ArcGIS Pro 1.3 or later. And these tools allow you to basically take your folder of imagery and it will write them to MRF and push them up into an Amazon bucket that you define. So you would create an Amazon S3 account. You would create your, your bucket where the imagery is going to be stored. The same process is true with Azure. And the optimized rasters tool will write the images out to the, uh, to the MRF format and push them into Amazon. And then it writes a proxy file that lives on a server at your organization. And that proxy file is what gets added to a Mosaic data set. That they'll be typically, they'll have the TIFF extension. You'll add those just like you would add a raster image in the process that I showed earlier. Create the Mosaic data set. And those proxy files allow me to reference the images that are up in Amazon. So it's a pretty efficient workflow. It's a pretty easy workflow to implement, and you get maximum performance out of your imagery over the cloud. Um, I want to talk about another common workflow that we've seen. Uh, actually, this year, a lot of DOTs have expressed interest in being able to take historical film imagery that they've got. A lot of the DOTs around the country have gone through the process of scanning all of their film and they've got these scanned images laying around, and they're not sure what to do with them. If you've got that kind of imagery and you would like to enable it to be vis visualized as an image service, um, we have a business partner that we work with called PCI Geomatics. And PCI Geomatics is a, a software application called uh, Historical Aerial Processing. This processing tool takes scanned imagery that's been digitized with all the fiducial marks and uh, generally what we need is a file, a text file or an Excel spreadsheet with all the flight path information and if you've got the camera information, the angle that the, that the imagery was collected in, um, the atmospheric conditions, if, if you've got that, Im that information, that's great. We can use it. If not, we likely can still work with you and what happens is um, the HAP software takes the digitized imagery, georeferences it, aligns it to typically some kind of elevation data set, like our global elevation data set, or if you've got your own last files with elevation, we can take that. And then it generates orthos, and then those orthos are mosaic together to create a service. So I'm going to show you what this looks like now. So Ohio about a year ago gave us some imagery that they wanted to have processed and now this imagery when they gave it to us wasn't georeferenced like it is currently. This is down around Cincinnati, Ohio at the um, at the merger of Interstate 74 and Interstate 75 and you can see the imagery has all the fiducial marks. You can see the marginella and uh, the fiducial marks are the little red ticks that you see at the corners and at the um, at the top center and bottom center of the image. And then you've got some uh, reference information that tells you what the scale was, what year it was collected, and um, what, it, what the file name is. So we were able to take this imagery, process it through the historical aerial processing software. It clipped off the marginella. And what it left us with was something that looks like this. So I'm going to turn off the, the unprocessed and show you the processed version. So you can see in the processed version, you can see some of the marginella exists around the borders, but in the center of the imagery, it looks perfect. And what really is striking is when you zoom in, say around this pool, um, what's really striking about this is if I set the transparency 
you can see that that image overlays practically right on top of that pool. I mean, it really is remarkable how tight that imagery is. That historical scan imagery was was able to be aligned and tightened to that to that underlying pool based on the last the uh, elevation data set we aligned it to. So you get some remarkable results with this historical imagery. So if you're interested in taking historical scan images and turning them into a service like this, and we've gone back on several types of imagery all the way back to the to the 40s in some cases. If the data is good enough, we can likely work with it. So um, if you're willing to talk to us, if you're interested, um, please reach out to myself, Terry, or Shannon, and we can get you in contact with um, and get you some people who can talk you through the process, and, and that includes myself. So um, we'd love to talk to you. Another application we introduced back in 2016 was Drone to Map. And so Drone to Map allows me to take a drone out in the field and collect imagery or LIDAR data, or both, uh, depending on how the drone's equipped. So basically, this would allow you to go out and fly a drone that's got the uh, aerial camera or a LIDAR sensor or both installed on board. You fly the area you're interested in. You bring the data back, and you run it through drone to map drone to map processes it and pushes it out to ArcGIS Online or Portal for ArcGIS. Uh, I can quickly create a valuable information product from my drone imagery. And um, like I said earlier, if you have a project and you want to periodically review the status of the project over time, this is a great inexpensive way to do that and then share the results. So the drone to map software builds a custom format called an integrated mesh. And the integrated mesh is actually an open format that we released uh, last year and several other companies have latched onto it and are using it in their products as well. But drone to map takes your imagery, processes it into a 3D view. So you'll see here as I start to zoom in, we see the 3D view extract itself and you start to see the buildings. Um, sometimes if you get kind of close, um, the features can look like a melted cake. Um, you start to see that it looks kind of weird in some instances, but as, depending on the resolution of the LiDAR sensor, uh, the results can be really striking. So I can uh, basically fly through an area and we see this three-dimensional view and the integrated mesh is exactly that. It's a tin basically integrated with um, with a texture. So you get the texture, the aerial photo draped and built right into the, the tin or the mesh and then that gets published to ArcGIS Online and I can visualize it in my scene viewer like I'm doing right now. So I've got all these um, these uh, slides that I've created and I can travel around and get a, a pretty nice view of, of a roadway project that I might be developing or working on or a new corridor that we're developing. So it's a great way to share that inf information out with the public and give them an idea of what a particular project is going to look like as you go through time. So the last thing I want to talk about before we start talking about this idea of a system of engagement is um, one of the benefits of publishing imagery to, uh, to the image server is that I can view it in many different clients. So you've kind of seen so far the web map viewer being able to take imagery that I publish, but I've also got here, um, I've also got Bentley MicroStation, and I've taken my service that I published through ArcGIS server and I've loaded it in. So I can, of course, zoom in on an area and in a matter of a couple of seconds, it's gonna render this uh, beautiful image. You'll see it here as it tightens up and I've actually got a, a, my hill shade underneath it. So you're seeing underneath the image, in some instances, you're seeing that texture. So as I zoom out, again, you'll start to see some of that texture underneath over here to the right. Um, you see it underneath the image. So we get that 3D, uh, it's almost like a 2.5D uh, view of my image. And this is a seamless, it's the same service I just showed you a few minutes ago of, um, of Dayton in the web map viewer. So you see the DEM hillshade in the background, 
with my imagery draped on top. So if I'm doing any kind of construction project or uh, design work and I want to work with seamless imagery rather than trying to identify what project imagery I need, being able to serve that imagery out one time to many different clients is a powerful proposition. So I can take that service, that image service I created, and also simultaneously publish it as a WMS service. And then the WMS service can be consumed by MicroStation. Now MicroStation, because it's consuming WMS, can't do the on-the-fly processing I was able to do in the ArcGIS client. But it can still visualize the imagery and get fast access to this imagery on the fly. Um, I know a lot of DOTs, the common practice is to go out and zip up copies of imagery and you've got all these different zip files and copies of imagery laying around. How great would it be to take all of that imagery that you hold from any year and make it accessible to any client and they don't have to copy a thing. They can just load the service into MicroStation or GeoMedia or whatever the, whatever the application happens to be and visualize it all in one place. Uh, and any number of services that they want, they can load them into the, to the, to the view and start working with it as a layer, as a, as a, as a level and um, work with it and build their design files right off of an Esri service that's available enterprise-wide. All right. So that is essentially what the system of engagement means. I can take my imagery and I can build intelligent applications, information products, and I can share with a maximum number of users. Uh, the imagery is dynamic, as you've seen so far. It's interactive, it's informative, and it's engaging. So I can make any number of products. Um, you've seen some of the on-the-fly processing I've done. Um, for those of you out there who have imagery sources like oblique imagery, like pictometry, we actually have a widget natively available right out of Web App Builder that will allow you to take those services as well and make those accessible in web applications. So there's lots of different sources of imagery that you can work with inside of all of our applications, and most of them can be configured in a matter of an hour or less, depending on how many services you have available and your exposure to Web App Builder. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of different, um, different products. So I mentioned this earlier when I showed the on-the-fly processing. You've already seen this to some degree. I've got my aerial photo, my color photo on the left, and my infrared on the right. It's all coming from the same service. I'm just I'm, I'm just doing the on-the-fly processing and visualizing one image two different ways. And of course, I can click on my project and get information about the project right inside the, um, right inside the application. So I'm using the Story Map Swipe tool to do this visualization, and it's very effective. In addition, I've got the index loaded below the photo. So for those of you who aren't familiar, when you create a mosaic data set, one of the things that gets created, and I'll show you this right now, is, is an index. There's a, actually a boundary and an index. So the boundary is the boundary of the entire mosaic that's been generated by, by the mosaic data set when I add rasters. And then in addition to that, each individual image is cataloged through the, through the index, through the footprint. And of course, I can add my own attributes, which I've done. I've added the year that the imagery was collected and the pixel size of the imagery. So you can click on any image in my service and figure out what year it was collected, what the, what the, what the bit type is. So in my case, it's, uh, it's six inch pixels and was collected in 2012. And then of course, you've got the image underneath that. So I just reversed in my service the order of the two. I've got the image draped on top of the index, and I can click on any part of my image and get that information out of it in a matter of seconds. We can display color versus impervious surface. So the, again, this is just another way of visualizing, which we've already seen. In addition to that, I mentioned 
my LIDAR data. I've, I'm visualizing LIDAR data two ways. We're looking on the left at a digital elevation model. And on the right, we're looking at a surface model. And on the surface model, you see the entire surface. You see all return. You see the buildings. You see the trees. You see all the bridge decks. And on the left, we see the, the elevation model, which just has bare earth return only. So we've extracted out all return. And we basically cut out all the buildings, all the trees, and all the, uh, all the bridge decks that go across the, uh, the water features that you see, or the, um, the hydrology. So again, I can serve out not only imagery, but LIDAR data. And this is very powerful to be able to visualize and access the hill shade. Or I can access my LIDAR data as aspect, so I can see the direction that any point on the on the surface is, is, is directed at. I can also see slope on the right. So here the brown indicates higher slope areas, whereas the gray indicates flatter areas. And then the yellow indicates a little bit steeper until we get down to the brown. So there's just a number of information products we can leverage. And that brings me to the final section of this, of this webinar, and that is this concept of the system of insight. So if I were to categorize what we've talked about so far, the system of record and the system of engagement, I would categorize them this way. Um, if I were starting out and I've never worked with the image extension before, the image server before rather, I would categorize them this way. Getting, my, getting to the point where I actually create the mosaic data set and I start managing that imagery would be what I would consider crawling. And then walking would be able to serve that out and start to build information products off of it. The last thing, this idea of a system of insight, I consider running. Being able to take all this imagery, all this LiDAR data, and actually do analysis off of it. That's really where you want to get to. And it's probably um, the most work involved is getting to that point. But once you've got the imagery served out and managed, this part becomes really easy to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about gaining insight from my imagery. So I've got a couple different products I've put together. The first is just a simple project profile. So I've got um, my LiDAR in the background. We don't see it here in the map. But if I click on a, a road project, the tool below is going to generate an elevation profile. So we see an elevation profile along this particular project. And as I travel through the graphic, on the bottom, we see exactly where my pointer is on the map. So I can see with relatively high accuracy where I am along the project line and what the elevation is, um, if it's above or below the surface, um, and what the elevation, what the minimum elevation was where I started and what the maximum elevation is. Actually, I'm sorry, the minimum elevation of the profile and the maximum of the profile. We can see what the starting elevation was and what the ending elevation was. We can see what the total change in elevation is overall. And this is using my elevation data set, my last files that I served out. That's pretty powerful to be able to take that and analyze my project data against that. Or maybe you've got safety data that you want to take a look at. Or maybe you've got some other um, asset information that you want to examine. So there's a number of different assets that I can overlay and get the elevation profile. Uh, I can also ask questions in my imagery. So for instance, I've set up a couple of tools that allow me to do line of sight. These are just using geoprocessing. I publish geoprocessing tasks against uh, ArcGIS server, and I'm making them available through Web App Builder. So I want to do a line of sight from the view of someone driving a car. So I'm going to draw my line, and I'll execute this, and it's going to generate a line of sight right on top of that yellow line. So when it's done, we'll see a red and green line indicating what I should be able to see and what may be invisible to me uh, based on the underlying raster. Now, I think when I process this, I use the digital elevation model, so the bare earth. So we've got some, in, we've got some irregularities in the DEM, but you can see it generates that line and it shows me where my obstructions would be. So if you're going up a hill or you're looking at um, 
what the viewer is going to see from a certain position on the highway, you can generate one of these against your DEM. And my DEM is not the most, it doesn't have the highest resolution of DEMs ever. This data, again, is from several years ago. So um, it, it doesn't quite have the number of points that m some of the newer last data that's coming out has. But you get the idea, I think. Another thing I can do, and this is always something that DOTs are looking to do, is uh, this concept of clip, zip, and ship. So here I have a tool that lets me basically draw a box, execute it, and it's going to find the images inside the box as well as the last files and kick out a download to me. So I'll start that download, and it's 18 megs. It was a small area. But you get the idea. And in the in the zip file, I've got the raw TIFF images and the last file. So I can take those. And if I am working in a project and I need a copy of that data, I have the ability to go get it. Or I want to make this available to the public so they can get a copy of the data. This is a great tool to make that happen. And then some other types of applications. This is an, a very simple application that allows me to identify a section of uh, uh, images that fall in a certain area. So for instance, I can click on, uh, on US 35 and add the rasters. So I can add these individually. So I think I mentioned earlier at the very beginning, not only can I view the mosaic, but I can view the individual raster images. And I could download these, I could visualize them, I can use the, the names to, to, to help me when I go to do a project, ex identify exactly what images I need to get to. And so now, being able to search for those images is, is a much more realistic task. It's not an overly difficult task. And I could do this against multiple years and be able to add multiple years and compare them and contrast them and do things like uh, transparencies or sliders so I can look and do some change detection if necessary. All right. The final thing I want to talk to you about is uh, this concept of raster analysis. So uh, again, the system of insight enables me to do raster analysis against my data. And I'm looking in Pro right now, ArcGIS Pro. And um, you saw earlier in Pro, or in the web map, that I was able to go in and change the, the type of image. I went and changed it to infrared. and Again, just like in the web map, in a matter of a couple of seconds, I'll be looking at not just a color image, but a color infrared image. So you get the same sorts of, of um, tools to modify your imagery that we saw earlier uh, in the web map. This is taking a second here, but uh, oh. Pro might not like the fact that I'm doing this over a webinar. Um, all right, well, I'll change it back. All right, so um, the last thing is this idea of analysis, right? So um, Pro, when you, when you set up the image server, the image server has some capabilities that were added to it at 10, ArcGIS 10.5. One of the capabilities is this ability to do raster analysis at the server level. So instead of me having to run my analysis on the desktop and wait days, sometimes um, a week, to get analysis back or results back, I can run those same types of uh, results or that same type of analysis on the server itself. So instead of doing all the processing on my machine, I can offload it. So we give you several different processing tools, about 11 overall, and we can do things like calculate density or create view sheds or convert a feature to a raster or convert a raster to a feature. Um, in addition, I can also add additional uh, chains of processes, just like geoprocessing. So for instance, if I want to do analysis, I can do um, the NDVI colorization I showed you. I can do cost distance. Um, I can do. Uh, I can change the appearance of the imagery. I can change the contrast. I can pan sharpen or resample. Um, I can do surface analysis on a DEM. I can do aspect, curvature, hill shade, 
shaded relief. So there are a number of processes I can run. In addition, I can do some data management. I can clip an area. I can interpolate an area. I can, there's just a number of processes. And I can put these processes together just like a geoprocessing script. And I can run my tool against them. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add my uh, DEM. And I've got, um, I've added a couple of uh, features here. I added some features that we can process against. So I want to go ahead and get a bridge deck. So I'm going to draw a box around a bridge deck. And uh, let's open up the clip tool. And I'm going to make sure that we get inside the, the clip. And we want to use the DSM, the surface model. And we are going to use the polygon notes. And I'll go ahead and click OK. And we'll run this. So uh, let's go back to my raster function and let's uh, run it. Looks like I did it the opposite. So I told it inside. I really wanted outside. I wanted everything. I wanted everything outside the polygon. So I've got my. My process, and you can see it took a matter of seconds to grab the information it needed and actually process it. Uh, let me go in and adjust that. Oh, I, something must have happened with my notes. I think that's what happened. It just processed the whole thing. But um, I think you get the idea. So in a matter of a few seconds, I can run a process against my data and get results back that normally would take quite a bit of time if I were to do this on my desktop. It's all because the work is being offloaded to the server, and the server is managing that work and balancing it out across all the servers that might be participating in that image server deployment. So uh, that's another point I want to bring up is that at 10.5 our licensing changed and it encourages more the ability of offloading servers to do the specific work that they were designed to do. So for instance, within, if, you, if you have an image server at 10.5, you no longer have to have an ArcGIS server license with that. That's just part of having the image server. So now that means I can take that image server, deploy it off on its own server, and I can federate it back to my portal and basically set it up so that it is dedicated to handling imagery only. So what that basically means is if I've got an, a server with roads and highways on it, an ArcGIS server, and I want to do image, I want to do image management, I don't have to take that image server and load it on top of my roads and highways. ArcGIS server. I can actually offload it onto its own environment so it can do the thing it was meant to do, which is handle imagery and process imagery and serve out imagery. So it just makes that licensing and that deployment pattern so much more effective now because I can offload that from the server that's handling map services. So this image server, all I've got it doing is raster processing and image serving. And that's exactly what, that's the exact kind of flexibility that we find that our customers need in order to do the work that they're doing. So with that, I'm going to close this up and just thank you for attending today. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Terry. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back to Terry. All right. Uh, thanks, Eric. Well, that's uh, there we go.
There we go. Thanks, Eric. Um, that was great. So as I said, here are the links, uh, the slides, as well as the uh, story map that Eric uh, created uh, will be uh, up on uh, the GeoNet for the DOTs. And uh, at this point in time, uh, any questions that you have, feel free to type them into the question box, and we'll answer uh, as many questions as we can in the next few minutes before we close this out. So, uh, so Eric, you mentioned the ability uh, to generate a WMS file uh, and then read that into MicroStation. Uh, how about similarly with uh, Autodesk? Uh, we have a capability there as well. Yeah, so the great thing about that workflow is uh, when you publish out a WMS, that's supported by all the, that, that's an open format, and it's supported by all the third-party vendors. So our AutoCAD can read it, uh, GeoMedia can read it, um, any number of clients out there, MapInfo, I mean, you name it, just about everybody can read WMS. So when I publish that service out as an image service, if you, tick, if you check the tick next to uh, the WMS capability in the capabilities section when you publish, that will automatically publish it out both ways so that I can access it either or. And um, you'll see here, well, you won't see here, but um, you'll see in the arrest services when you do that, you'll have an extra entry for WMS that you can see all the metadata, you can see all the same information that I would typically see if I went and viewed a REST service. So. Okay, we have another question. Should the base TIFF files be on the same server as the Mosaic data sets? Uh, yeah, good question. So uh, not required. Um, as long as you can, as long as the server can access the images, uh, it's actually preferred that they're on network attached storage. Um, like a fast SAN or network attached storage device. And as long as the ArcGIS server account that is part of the image server can access that imagery because that's the identity that's going to grab the images and serve them out, as long as it can get to those files, you're fine. And we, we typically will point to those, when we reference those images in a Mosaic data set, we'll use UNC paths to reference where the images are located. So that's more than acceptable to do it that way. And, and any performance degradation if you have them on separate servers at all? Or? Uh, no, the only time you would see a degradation if, is if you, did, if you did something other than a network attached storage device. So if it's not a high speed redundant storage device, I wouldn't waste my time because then you will see some degradation. Um, so you want to be aware of that. Okay, um, and so in talking to you know any number of DOTs, what are you seeing in terms of the patterns? How many are hosting their own imagery internal on portal, or uh, how many are, are offloading out to the out to the cloud? Uh, right now, it's overwhelmingly in favor of people. Um, it's overwhelmingly in favor of people hosting their own imagery, although. A lot of people are starting to think about the cloud as an alternative because of the fact that Amazon S3 storage and Azure storage are so cheap. It's, it's really a, an affordable alternative, and many people are starting to look that way. So uh, again, it, it's not very difficult to do, and, um, and like I said, it's pretty affordable. So we're, we do see a lot more people hosting their own, but they're, they're starting to look. And there are a few companies that are actually offering to host uh, uh, imagery at, at no cost. Uh, you've yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, we have a partner out there called Mapillary. Um, Mapillary is, uh, uh, they are a company that will take photo log information. So if you're out there and you have photo log information and you're trying to figure out how to maximize how you're going to make it available to a large audience, Mapillary will take that imagery, stitch it together, and they have a widget for Web App Builder that basically gives you a street view similar to what you would get on um, Google, 
and it's your imagery that you're utilizing and they don't charge you to do it where mapillary generally um, makes their money is if, if you give them permission they will resell that imagery back to automakers who are doing work with autonomous vehicles so a lot of the automakers are interested in grabbing that imagery and utilizing it for uh, autonomous vehicles uh, if you're not comfortable doing that, then there will be a charge, um, it's a modest charge to post the imagery and uh, process it, but, um, but that is available. Okay. Um, so you talked about the process of, of working with PCI geomatics. Uh, does that yep. really need to be run as a third-party process? Uh, is that, how do I, how would uh, somebody go about uh, uh, going down that path? Yeah, so um, P, uh, the historical aerial processing software from PCI Geomatics is, uh, it's got a pretty high, there's a, there's a fairly high cost associated with it uh, for, the, for the use. Um, it costs about $80,000 for a license, and um, there is quite a bit of training that goes along with it. At Esri, we actually use it quite a bit. Um, the folks that do the work for uh, professional services. They do a lot of work with the military and have gone back over, um, gosh, lots of years to process imagery that the military has collected. So we actually have licenses of it and we can do term licensing with PCI Geomatics. So um, for a fairly modest cost, we can do uh, processing of the imagery for you on a term license of PCI Geomatics. So you don't have to worry about the cost of buying the software that you're probably only going to use to process, you know, a dozen or two dozen, maybe 40 years worth of imagery one time and not have to ever use again and then train somebody. So we can pretty much knock that out for depending on how much, how many years and um, how much imagery you have, we can do it fairly inexpensively. So if you have questions, please again reach out to me or Terry or Shannon. We can we can we can talk to you more about it. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, and any other questions? Uh, we'll uh, last chance here. If uh, type your questions into the box. Um, Otherwise, as I said, uh, this the entire webinar will actually be uh, up on the webinar series, uh, past webinars as well. You can you can check out that's the first link uh, that you're seeing at the moment, and then all of the slides as well as the story map that uh, Eric was showing will be on GeoNet, and uh, we do then also give you a link to uh, our for uh, imagery uh, pages and uh, so with that uh, we'd like to thank you all for being on the call today and uh, we look forward to welcoming you at uh, future uh, webinars so uh, great thank you